Prep for all women, cis and transgender women. Welcome to Clinical Minute. Sandra is a 31-year-old African-American cisgender female. She presents to your sexual and reproductive health clinic with vaginal discharge. She identifies STI testing as the primary reason for her visit. Reviewing her new patient health history form, you note that she indicates preference for she-her pronouns. She works full-time as a paralegal, has health insurance, does not take any medications, and does not have any current medical problems. She indicated a history of one full-term pregnancy, no abortions or miscarriages, and lists condoms as her current contraceptive method. She also indicated a gynecological exam within the last five months, which included a cervical cancer screening and STI and HIV tests with negative results. Her last period started one week ago, and she is not experiencing any menstrual-related problems. At your clinic, you routinely conduct an in-depth sexual health history for each patient. You routinely follow the ALLOW model to explore current concerns and symptoms and develop treatment plans that meet each patient's sexual and reproductive health needs and goals. The ALLOW model stands for A. Ask L. Legitimize L. Limitations O. Open for further discussion and W. Work together to develop a treatment plan. This method allows you to remain patient-centered, focus on any immediate problems, and refer or plan to meet future or more complex health goals at another visit. The first three steps, ask, legitimize, and limitations, apply even in clinics not dedicated to sexual and reproductive health, where time limits may prohibit fully addressing complex concerns. This is because the limitations step allows the healthcare provider to explain any time or experience limitations that may prevent fully resolving patient concerns in a single visit. It also allows for an optional step of asking patients to return for a separate visit or referring them to an appropriate specialist. After entering the room and introducing yourself, you thank Sandra for filling out her health history and let her know you would like to ask some additional questions to better understand her current symptoms and sexual and reproductive health needs. After she says, that's fine, you start by asking Sandra general social questions and review her current symptoms. She states that she has current symptoms of slight, tacky, white vaginal discharge that sometimes has a weird smell. This symptom has been present for the last month, and she has never experienced this symptom previously. Then you pause to ask additional permission to ask about specific sexual health concerns. You explain that you ask these questions of every patient with the goal of understanding her needs. You emphasize that she can choose not to answer any questions if she does not want to. You go on to ask her about her sexual history. She states that she is currently sexually active with one male partner and has no additional partners in the last one year. Her initial intercourse was at 17 years of age, and she has had four or five partners total, all of them male. She shares that she engages in oral and vaginal intercourse, but does not have anal intercourse. She states she and her partner always use condoms, and that the last unprotected intercourse was more than two years ago. In talking more, Sandra shares that her current partner is the father of their daughter. When you ask if she would like to plan additional pregnancies, she says that she's not sure. Maybe, but definitely not anytime soon. You recognize that having more children is a longer-term decision, one that won't be resolved today. She does say that she sometimes has problems with intercourse. She appears to become anxious after this admission, speaking more quietly and avoiding eye contact. You tell her you are glad she shared this with you, and you legitimize her problem by stating that many couples have problems with intimacy and intercourse. You inform her that you want to explore this concern more in a few moments after completing her full history. 
As you have completed gathering her history information, this seems to be an ideal time to open the conversation for further discussion. You then ask Sandra why she feels there is a problem with intimacy. She explains that she and her partner planned their first child after dating for three or four years. However, shortly after their daughter was born, her partner lost his job and could not find work, and their relationship became difficult. They decided to separate around the time their daughter was one year old. He has always been an active parent, and since he was not able to provide financial support, he continued to contribute to daytime care of their child while Sandra continued to work full-time. During this time, they both tried dating other people. After about a year, they decided that they would start dating each other again. However, he seemed nervous about having sex with her. After a few months of dating, he told Sandra that he'd had sex without a condom with a few people he didn't know very well. He got nervous and went into a clinic for STI and HIV testing. His HIV test came back positive. He shared with Sandra that he had been seeing a doctor and was taking HIV medications, but that he could not have sex with her until she knew. Although this could have resulted in another breakup, they both recommitted to staying together. Sandra adds that he is a great dad. She enjoys being with him, and her job is enough financially especially since he takes care of their daughter instead of sending her to daycare. About five months ago, they decided to start having sex again. They have used a condom every time, but it makes her very nervous. You ask her if she enjoyed intercourse or had any problems with intimacy before their breakup. She says, actually, no. Before he contracted HIV, she enjoyed sex, and they usually had sex two to four times per week. Since his HIV diagnosis and their recommitment to their relationship, they have only had sex four or five times, and she is so anxious that she does not enjoy it or have orgasms. You reassure Sandra, again legitimizing her concerns, by acknowledging that it is common for couples to struggle with resuming intercourse after one partner receives an HIV diagnosis. You know that, despite an overall annual decline in new HIV diagnoses, there were 39,513 new HIV infections in the United States in 2015. Cisgender women accounted for 19%, or 7,402, of those newly diagnosed infections. Of these, approximately 86% were attributable to heterosexual sex, while 13% were attributable to injection drug use. African Americans continue to suffer disproportionate impacts related to HIV infection, and 58% of cisgender women infected with HIV identify as African American. Based on the information Sandra has shared about herself and her partner, you recognize that she meets the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, Criteria for Pre-Exposure Prophylaxis, also known as PrEP. In the U.S., the only FDA-approved PrEP is a single pill containing a co-formulation of 300 mg tenofovir and 200 mg emtricitabine. When taken consistently, PrEP has been shown to reduce the risk of HIV infection in people who are at high risk by up to 92%. You are aware of the 2014 CDC guidelines recommending PrEP for use in healthy adults at risk of acquiring HIV infection, including men who have sex with men, heterosexually active men and women, and people who inject drugs. The guidelines indicate that PrEP is suitable for healthy HIV-negative adult women who have sex with men and meet the following eligibility criteria more than one partner in lifetime, and at least one of the following, sex with a known HIV-positive partner, any condomless sex within the last four weeks, any sex, regardless of condom use, with a high-risk partner within the last 12 months. Recent estimates predict that approximately 468,000 women in the U.S. meet these eligibility criteria. Sandra meets the criteria because she has had more than one partner in her lifetime 
and has had sex with a known HIV-positive partner. You also know that CDC guidelines for initiation of PrEP are the same for all people, regardless of gender, and that several lab tests are required prior to initiation of PrEP. These labs include confirmation of HIV negative status, pregnancy testing, hepatitis B and C testing, serum creatinine or estimated creatinine clearance, and screening for other STIs. There are also no differences in recommended routine follow-up monitoring based on gender. At one month, recommended follow-up includes testing for newly acquired HIV infection and counseling about any side effects and adherence. After that, follow-up every three months would include HIV testing, a pregnancy test, and counseling and education about risk reduction and adherence. Follow-up monitoring for creatinine clearance and STI testing is recommended every six months. You conduct Sandra's exam. The wet prep reveals that she has bacterial vaginosis. You review the findings with her and prescribe treatment. She is very relieved at this news. You also explain to her that you will also be sending out a vaginal swab to test for gonorrhea and chlamydia, just to be sure. Those results will be available in 7 to 10 days. You explain to Sandra that there's a medication called PrEP that can provide additional protection from HIV and might help her feel less anxious about having sex with her partner. In fact, if taken every day, it can reduce the risk of HIV infection by 92%. Even with PrEP, you still recommend using a condom. She seems interested and relieved and asks if there are any side effects. You tell her that possible side effects include headache, nausea, flatulence, and dizziness. In general, side effects are mild and usually resolve within the first four weeks. She says that she's pretty sure she'd like to start taking PrEP, but that she'd like to think about it. You also explain to her that there are some additional tests that you would need to order, both today and on a regular basis, if she does decide to take PrEP. You review the tests recommended by CDC prior to initiation of PrEP, including pregnancy test, HIV test today, serum creatinine, and hepatitis screening. If she'd like, you can start the testing process today so that she'll be all set if she does decide to start taking PrEP. She agrees for you to order a urine pregnancy test and a rapid HIV test in your office. Both tests are negative. You share her results with her before she leaves the clinic. Additionally, you order tests for gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, a hepatitis panel, and a complete metabolic panel, which includes creatinine, to evaluate kidney function. You provide her with a copy of the PrEP patient agreement form, which can be found on the Truvada REMS website. Alternately, you could utilize a similar form from the CDC Clinical Providers Supplement. You ask her to review this form over the next two weeks and to prepare any questions or concerns she may have. You anticipate having her sign the form with you at her next visit. After confirming that Sandra has Internet access, you provide her with a printed list of online resources, including thewellproject.org, which has a page for women considering PrEP, the brochure developed by Project Inform, a new option for women for safer loving, resources from hiveonline.org, which has information for couples living with HIV who are considering pregnancy. Before ending today's visit, you remind her that in the interim, and even after she initiates PrEP, continuing to utilize condoms, as they have done so far, is important in preventing HIV infection. You also offer the option of bringing her partner to the next visit. You explain that it might be good for them to come to an appointment together either at the next visit or one of her follow-up visits to discuss preparing for a pregnancy. She agrees to review the information and return in two weeks. However, she states that she does not think she will bring her partner to her next visit. She may consider it in the future, but for now, she wants to focus on meeting her own needs. After about 10 days, you receive results from Sandra's pending labs. 
her syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia tests are all negative. Additionally, her serum creatinine is 0.8 mg per deciliter, which falls within the normal range of 0.6 to 1.1 mg per deciliter for cisgender females. Since your lab facility provides corresponding estimated creatinine clearance calculation, you see that hers is within normal, greater than 60 milliliters per minute. Additionally, her hepatitis B surface antigen, antibody, and total hepatitis B core antibody results are all negative. These results indicate that she does not appear to have current or previous infection with hepatitis B or a prior vaccination. You call Sandra and review her test results with her. You also inform her of the option to begin her hepatitis B vaccine series at her next visit. You explain that the vaccine is a series of three injections, which can be conveniently combined with her follow-up schedule related to PrEP. She states she will consider her options and will probably get the vaccine. Her appointment for follow-up is scheduled in four days. At her return visit, she appears much less anxious than previously. She says she has reviewed the information you gave her and does not have any other questions. You review the Truvada REMS patient provider agreement with her, which both of you sign. You provide a copy to her, file a copy in her chart, and remind her that she will need to come in for follow-up appointments every three months. At those appointments, she will have time to review any side effects review any problems she experiences with taking the medication as prescribed, share any new changes in her relationship status or risk factors for HIV, and have an HIV test to ensure that she has not contracted HIV. You remind her that if she develops any symptoms of illness, becomes concerned about HIV infection, or has other questions before her scheduled appointments, she can always call or come in more frequently. She completed her treatment for bacterial vaginosis and reports her symptoms completely resolved. She also reports feeling a lot less anxious since she had an opportunity to talk to you. You provide Sandra with a script for PrEP, one pill per day with a 90-day supply. You remind her that PrEP is most effective if taken every day and remind her that you recommend continuing to use condoms. You review the hepatitis B vaccination with her again, and she states she will start the hepatitis vaccine today. You schedule a follow-up in one month for the purpose of providing her next hepatitis vaccine and also to check in on how things are going with her new medication. Later that day, you receive a fax from the pharmacy stating her insurance requires prior authorization. You complete the forms, return them as instructed, and receive confirmation the following day the medication has been approved. You also receive a voicemail message from Sandra stating that she started the medication.